Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, somebody had said that uh, there was about 30 people maybe last time. So, how about right here? Is that good? Give me just one second. All right. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see everybody today. Glad to be here. Um, we're going to just start off with the word of prayer as usual. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for this Sabbath day, Father. We thank you for the opportunities that we might be able to fellowship together and study your word. Uh, we just ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit today, Father, to give us peace in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, and uh, above all, to give us understanding of the words that we're about to read. Uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, once again, Jesus be the focal point and uh, the whole center of our study today, Father. And uh, we just ask for guidance once again from your Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so the uh, lesson study today is uh, entitled, The Eyes of the Lord, the Biblical Worldview. I'm going to start out with reading the memory text, as usual. And uh, we find that in Proverbs 15, verse 3. And it reads, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Okay, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that as we dive into this lesson study. Um, but I just want to make a quick comment uh, before we even get into what Sabbath afternoon is talking about. Um, so anybody want to comment on worldview? And you don't have to if you don't want to, but it's just a question. Yes, go ahead, brother. We all have one, whether we like it or not. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, the worldview that we're looking at here today is basically two worldviews. The uh, worldview, in which is the biblical worldview, which I'm sure we all believe in that view. And then there's, I guess we could just say the world view according to how non-Christians view the world view. Um, so, um, I'm really just going to go through the lesson today. I don't really have anything real dynamic outside of the lesson, so I'm just going to pretty much just go from the lesson, and if we did our lessons, we can just follow along, and uh, the best part is when we get to comment. So, um, basically, the beginning part is just talking about a poet who... Uh, writes about imaginary animals. And, and then at the end of it, he says that uh, these imaginary animals, he's comparing it to our notion of the worldview. Um, he says uh, that we have as much in common with real animals, as far as this fantasy animal goes, fantasy animals, excuse me, uh, that our notion of the worldview uh, we pretty much have the... Let me just read it. He says, uh, which began with his writing about imaginary animals, talking about rabbits, squirrels, and etc., the likes, and uh, have as much in common with real animals, he wrote, as our notion of the real world have with... as our notions of the world have with the real world. So in other words, the ideas that we have in notions, you know, sometimes tend to... If it's not biblical and grounded in truth and the Word of God, then a lot of our notions and our ideas and understandings tend to be something, uh, what I would say, uh, well, we'll just use the word imaginary. Or, you know, sometimes we come up with our own ideas that are so far from what the truth of the Bible says. Um, I'm just going to read the last part. Uh, it says, as human beings, we never look at the world from a neutral position. You know, we all have an opinion of one or the other, right? And uh, usually it's either atheism leading to uh, Darwinism as opposed to uh, Christian view and, and biblical understanding, right? So these are the two that we're looking at today. So it says, nobody really has a neutral position on this uh, we see it always and only through filters that impact how we interpret and understand the world around us. The filter is called a world view. And it is so crucial that we teach our young people and even our older church members biblical worldview. 
right? And, and, and it's so important because, you know, it's really interesting that uh, if you were to take 20 random people off the street and ask them a question on this world view, um, you would probably get more answers than just the two, you know, because of the fact that there's so many different religions and beliefs. Um, and then the atheistic point of view, there's so many different ideas, you know, from things like um, um, reincarnation, you know, or whatever that belief might be that people have, but we all have beliefs. Fortunately, that we as Christians can base our beliefs and we all pretty much have a, a relative same idea of understanding of what is truth because of the Bible. And I'm so happy for that because then my thoughts aren't out here and my morals aren't really out here, but they're based on, on something solid. Um, Okay, any comments before I move on? Okay, let's go to Sunday's lesson. Um, the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Oxford University professor theorized, and by the way, when you see that word theory, theory is the opposite of fact. Okay? So if it's a theory, it means that it's not factual. And if it's a fact, it's not a theory. Okay? So it says that uh, he theorized that we, the world, and everything around us, none of it is real. Instead, we are the digital creations of a race of aliens with super powerful computers. Well, meaning our brains, right? Um, <laughs> anyone want to comment on that? Dr. Herbert, go ahead. Today in the English language. Hmm, okay. Interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so the lesson goes on to say that, well, it's an interesting theory. It doesn't bring up a, cru a, crucial, cre <laughs> a crucial question. What is the nature of reality? So there's two possible answers, broad answers, it says. Uh, the first is that the universe and all that is in it, including us, just is. Uh, you know, one day I was sitting there, and I'm just going to give my point of view just for a second on something. Uh, and I was watching a television show, and this guy was talking about nature and plants. And as he was talking, I looked behind him. There's this whole, like, jungle of all these different plants. And we're not even talking animal life here or humans, just plants alone. And he was showing just one plant and, and, and breaking it down into what that plant ends up producing, what it does. And I'm thinking, this one little plant with all this information, just this little plant, you know, when you break down its DNA, um, the plant that it is and what it's capable of doing, you know, there's so much that goes into one little plant. And, and I'm thinking, that one little plant, there's so much. I mean... It, and then you look, and then you look at all these other plants, and you have to ask yourself, did this really all just happen? How could it all just happen, all this incredible design, because this plant does amazing stuff, this one plant. We're not even talking about animals and humans, you know, because I, I know if we were to break down humans, we could go into so much more. So that's one possible possibility here, is that everything just is, you know, or everything just happen by chance, as we always hear. Um, the other is, um, and by the way, it says uh, that the first, uh, or excuse me, um, let me go back here a second. Uh, where was I? Uh, so, 
even if only one is rational, the first is that the universe and all that in it just is, including us. Uh, nothing created it, nothing formed it. It just is here. It simply is a brute fact. There is no God. There are no gods. There is nothing divine. Reality is purely material, purely natural. Um, someone said 2,500 years ago, a uh, Greek philosopher um, said there is only atoms and void. He really said there's only atoms and, and empty space. Um, so even 2,500 years ago, they still had these same ideas. It probably dates back even further than that, obviously. But uh, so here you have the two, you know, uh, that everything just is, and the other is that there are no gods, there is nothing divine, uh, reality purely material, purely natural. Um, any comments? Anybody want to make a comment on that? No? Okay. Um, okay, so moving ahead. Uh, the other view is that some divine being or beings created the universe that indeed seems more logical, more rational, uh, more sensible than the idea that the universe just is with no explanation for it. This position encompasses the natural world, the world of atoms and the void, but it is not limited to it. It points to a reality that is much broader, deeper, and more uh, ma uh, multifaceted than the atheistic, materialistic view so often heard today. Agreed? You, you agree with the, the point of view that we believe in rather than the, the other world view? Of course, otherwise we wouldn't be here today, right? Okay. Um, so let's take a look at some text just briefly. Uh, which, uh, I'm not going to... I'm just going to quote 51.3 because uh, I love that verse. I always have. Uh, Proverbs 51.3 says that the fool says there is no God. And I like that because when you look at people and they claim that there is no God, uh, our understanding and what we know and believe, we automatically think, how foolish. It is foolish. You know, that they don't believe in a God or a creator. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Mark. Right. And um, sometimes I root for the evolutionists because of the faulty claims that uh, the, the Christian presents about God. I actually want the evolutionists to win because they're proving that that God doesn't exist and that God doesn't exist. Um, but when we have a true, accurate portrayal of the God of the Bible, nothing can stand against that. That's, Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, I have a book that I just recently got that my mom had sent me, and it's got some really interesting stuff. I was going to bring it and share it. I'll bring it next Sabbath, though, but amazing book. It, it's, it's more of a picture book and a biblical understanding book, and one section that it has in it that I was really uh, interested in was uh, it shows... I'm not sure how many different religions, but it covers a lot of religions. And what it does is it shows what they believe, you know, when they started, how they started. But the belief part was really interesting because, like you say, as Christians, we are still divided in our beliefs. I mean, we all believe in the Word of God, of course, which is how we should believe. But unfortunately, all of the different religions don't all agree 
on even important matters as like salvation or who Jesus Christ is. You know, some religions believe that he was the brother of, of Satan and other things that, you know, he's not God, you know, that he was just a prophet and on and on. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So a lot of times the Christian view uh, can push people away and it has, especially unfortunately because of the doctrines and teachings that come from, I'll, I won't say the church, but uh, the beast, the Antichrist church. And that's where those teachings come from that you mentioned. Um, yeah, Dr. Herbert, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, uh, a lot of times, yeah, we will read scriptures, any of us, uh, and try to interpret them ourselves, you know, of our own understanding. Of course, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, do not lean on that, on thine own understandings, right? Um, but it's so true. A lot of times we'll read something, and if we don't really know the answer, we'll try to come up with an answer of what our own idea is, which is very dangerous, of course. But... I always tell people that, you know what, if you need an answer in the Bible, the only way to get the true answer is to let the Bible interpret it. Because it does. In anything, and everything, if you need the answer in, from the New Testament, you have to go to the Old Testament to find the answers. But the answers are there. Don't ever go by what you think and put things together. Always go by biblical teachings and biblical teachings only. That's the only way we can come to real truth and understanding. Otherwise, we fall into that trap and that's why there's so many different ideas today of what the truth is. Um, okay, so uh, does somebody want to read? Uh, can somebody read Isaiah 54, verse 21? Um, another one of those verses that it tells us to look with, I'm just going to say it because we're all familiar with it, John 3, 16. I don't think I even need to say that one right. But just keep that in, in mind. Um, because it's talking about a... a character trait of God that's really important in the world of Christianity, which is God is love, right? God is love. Uh, does somebody have that verse? If not, and would you like to read it? Go ahead, brother. I think you, you mean Isaiah 45? Uh, yeah, what did I say? I think you said 54. That's okay. Yeah, 45. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the last part I think is the part that we're really looking at is that God says that he's the one, he's the creator, and there's only one God, there's no other gods. Um, let me see if we got one more we can pull here. Um, what we're looking at, the, the, the questions here would be, uh, give me one second. Sorry, I, I didn't come earlier to grab the literal physical lesson study, so I'm just doing it all from here today, uh, so bear with me. Um, okay, and then it keeps going right back up. Uh, I apologize. Okay, so central to any Christian education is a reality not just of God, but of the kind of God that he is. Um, and the question was, what do the following texts have to say about the ideas raised in today's lesson? Um, so we saw that God is the creator, right? Um, in that last text, God says that uh, the fool says there is no God. That would be the worldview, not a Christian worldview. Uh, let me just go ahead and read the next uh, section. 
Uh, so once again, it says, central to any Christian education is a real God who loves us and who interacts with us. He is a God of miracles who, uh, through using natural laws, or excuse me, though using natural laws, is not bound by those laws and who can transcend those laws when he wills, such as the virgin conception of Jesus. The teaching of this view is especially per uh, pertinent in our day because so much of this, of the, un of the intellectual world claiming that science supports it openly and unapologetically teaches the atheistic and naturalistic world view. Um, I'm going to read the rest of it also. Think about how narrow and limited the athe atheistic worldview is in contrast to the biblical worldview, which encompasses the natural world but isn't limited by it. Why, in the end, is the biblical worldview, the atheistic worldview, simply so much more logical and rational than its atheistic rival. So, I don't know if you guys followed all of that or not. I, I know I didn't read it too clearly. Um, but it's basically showing the two views, and one is saying that the natural world encompasses the biblical world. Is that right? You guys can help me out with this if you'd like. <laughs> um, it's just basically showing the two views and saying that, uh, you know, they always try to put science into the Bible, but you can't always do that because there is no way you can put evolution into the Bible. They don't mix. Is that, is that true? It, it actually contradicts it, doesn't it? Yeah. So when they try to mix the two, because some people will try and say, Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is awesome because if you think of most of the universities and colleges and things like that, they, they laugh at anyone who said they believe in creation. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you have a lot of the creationists who try to morph the story of creation with naturalism. And they come up with theories like, oh, it wasn't set in the literal days. They were Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
encompasses everything, and the natural world is one of the little things that falls within God, you know, the truth. And uh, but we, we can explain that, you know, only to a limit because we weren't there. One of my favorite things go is that my ways are above your ways. You just kind of take up the head of it. You know what? That's right. Observe it, study it, and learn about me from it. But by all means, don't try to explain who I am. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I agree fully, and those are two really good points to bring up. You know, I always, it's always interesting to me how an atheist will uh, say, well, you know, you weren't there, but yet they'll talk about billions of years ago, and the Bible only goes back 6,000 years, but yet you don't believe it. <clears throat> and the thing about the Bible is there's written evidence. The billions of years, there's no written evidence of that. So we have a little bit more to grasp. Go ahead, brother. Uh, oh. I don't mean to point, I shouldn't point, but <laughs> uh, go ahead, Brother Dan. Uh, well, to build on Mark's thing, it, it's a symbiotic relationship. Michael, Michael Beebe, uh, who is not a creationist, but he's an intelligent designer, uh, he, he came up with the mousetrap theory that said it takes four parts for the mousetrap to work. And without one of those parts there, the whole mousetrap won't work. So, the human type, for example, has so many other parts that are needing other parts in order to function. So without those parts being there, they would have no purpose. Therefore, they wouldn't have evolved to that. It, with creation versus evolution, the way I look at it, evolution, at least from what I've seen, attacks five things about Christianity. One, it calls God a liar. Because God said in, the, in, in Exodus 20 that it took him six days. Evolution says no, it didn't. So now you're putting man, man's ideas ahead of what God says. The two, it says that God's not big enough. He's not strong enough to have created the world in six days. Um, three, it says that the natural origins of sin are different. Instead of sin being a cause of then it's, it's a result of different species struggling for existence. So that takes away sin. The fourth, it takes away the need for Jesus. If sin is just struggling for existence, then we don't need a Savior. And five, <coughs> this is the most important to, well, Jesus and this one is the most important to me. If we don't believe that God created us in the first place, how can we believe that he can recreate us now? And if we are not recreated in the image of Christ, then we have no hope. Amen. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. That was good. Uh, um, I, I wanted to make one comment real quick, too, on what you said, you know, the whole primordial soup thing. You know, they say, well, this, this life started on this. First of all, you know, how can you get something out of nothing is for life form to start on a, a rock. Um, but then the question would be, to that, would be, well, where did that little life form come from? It had to come from somewhere. Uh, who, uh, you had a comment. Go ahead, Brother Vince. So I just want to share, hopefully, as much as I can, a little bit of my history, because the Amen. Amen. But just recently, the scientist who I respect the most for his knowledge of science, and we talk, you know, we have these small talks, but he's not on board with Christianity. But he just called me last week to tell me that he bought a Bible and he's starting to read it. Mm. But I'm going to tell you that somebody who is a, you know, seasoned researcher, they're a hard
when you look at science and, and Mark, you know, he talked about, you know, theories and proof and proving theories. The thing about models and theories is they really can't be proven. What we look for is they haven't been disproven. Right? So we keep on waiting for that day where that piece of evidence is proven. It's kind of similar to the Bible. When we look at our, all the archaeology, we have been waiting for us to disprove it. In my history of tens of thousands of valuable experiments, only a fraction of them meet their prediction. And that's the real reason why I'm here, is that science is very good when we point the flaws day after day after day. We can study, make a big book, organic chemistry. But when you look at the big traits from what men have learned, they're very low. The other thing I want to comment on is when we look at a lot of the scientific methods, for example, everybody, we might ask everybody here if you believe that an atom is composed of electrons, neutrons, protons, you say, I, I, I think I can agree with that. And, and why would you agree with it? Because you would, you would think, we have proof. We have some kind of proof. Well, so I, will, I will suggest to you that for whatever science proposes, there is no absolute proof. What you have, what you have is these analyses that were designed by man, and man came up with this uh, idea that the man's interpretation is, from this analysis, that the atom is composed of these three particles. It's an interpretation. Much like, you ever see those beautiful pictures of these nebulas and the, the, the inters, you know, these cool astrophysical galaxies? You know, and it's amazing. They exist of power and beauty. Well, all these images are electromagnetic, or they're collections of light from the infrared or the ultraviolet spectrum that come from the distance. But all that information is not a picture. It is a lot of just plotted gradients. But what you see in that picture is a scientist's interpretation of the data. And he is proposing that this is possibly what it looks like. The problem is we, we as people is we believe everything that we see as well. And we say, oh wow, that is amazing. That is that's what it means for you. But no, we do not know that that's what it is. It is a proposed interpretation of man's analysis. Yeah, and unfortunately just because we think somebody is really smart and educated that they have the right answer. But uh, if we look at history, we can go back in time, and that's one of the lesson studies here also, is that we can see all of the mistakes we made in the past of what we used to believe was truth. In today's modern thinking, we know that that's so far from the truth. You know, case in point, the earth is flat, right? Uh, yeah, did you have a comment, Dr. Herbert, before I go on? Okay. Um, yeah, and also I was thinking that, uh, you know, when... Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to go there right now. Let's just go to Mondays because we're getting short on time. Okay, so um, there was a question by a German thinker, writer, um, who said that... Uh, asked what is probably the most basic and foundational question possible. Why is there something instead of nothing? Pretty basic, right? Um, can somebody, we're going to look at a few texts, so I'm just going to, if somebody wouldn't mind reading, 
uh, if somebody could take Exodus 20, uh, no, that's too long. No, no, Exodus 28 through 11, and uh, Job 12, 7 through 10. And uh, there's one there that uh, I, I always say, and I'm going to say it again. <laughs> uh, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, three angels' message, I think that we should all know word for word. That we, and if we don't know it, I would encourage you to go and try to memorize it because as Adventists and proclaiming the th three angels' message because in these last days it is going to be us that is proclaiming that message, right? We're going we're to be proclaiming that message to non-believers and uh, uh, other people that are in other churches that don't have the truth and the light of the seven-day creation because that's what 14.7 points to, and it also points to the mark of the beast and the seal of God. So it's so important that we know how also we're going to be able to teach others if we're not really even familiar with that. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead, brother. Oh, okay. So who had the first one? Anybody volunteers? Go ahead. Oh, or did you have a question? Okay, what, go ahead with your comment. Yeah, good point. Um, what's that? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, by the way, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really great, if you, have, if you don't have it, I would encourage you all to get it. Uh, how many people are familiar with the days of Noah? I know there's other ones that are out there, but this one is the most recent one done by the Adventist Church. How many people have seen that, the days of Noah? Okay, write it down, I promise. It, it, it is an amazing, it, it, it talks about everything we're talking about here today and it takes it really in depth. The Days of Noah, write it down and get the DVD, I encourage you. It's, uh, you know, God is revealing in these last days to us. Uh, prophecy is unveiling right before our eyes. Things that we've never known, even a hundred years ago in LNG White's time, they're being revealed to us now. They are being unlocked now. I would encourage you guys to, to really take a look at that and get it. I promise you'll love it. Um, okay. Uh, so, did somebody have Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11? If not, I'll read it. Um, did somebody have Job 12, 7 through 10? Okay, you want to go ahead and take that? Yeah. 
Yes, amen. You know, and God tells us too. He says, we have no excuse not to believe in God or the word of God because all we have to do is take a look at nature, right? And we can see the evidences of God in all of the created world. Um, okay, did somebody want to do Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11? And like I said, if not, I'll take it. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, read it. Give me one second. Sorry, just bear with me a second here. Um, another one that I would recommend that we all learn by heart, uh, the Ten Commandments. It really isn't that hard to memorize them. The hardest ones is the second commandment and the fourth commandment and the tenth commandment. But uh, I think that the second one is really powerful uh, for us and the fourth one. The fourth one is the longest, right? And, and as Seventh-day Adventists, we should know that by heart. Okay? Um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the, seventh, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Uh, I don't think I need to continue. I can, but the point is, is that uh, I'm going to read 11 because that's, I think, the, the part we're getting to. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and on the seventh day he rested. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Right? Which, by the way, I just want to mention... I'm sure we all know, but I'm just going to mention it anyway. You can find that same, almost exact quote you'll find in the three angels, or I just read three angels, or excuse me, you'll find it in the three angels' message, right? First angel's message, first angel says, um, then I saw another angel flying high in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Right? Isn't that Exodus 20 talk? Isn't that Ten Commandment talk? But it also takes us where? What's so important about that and why is it in the three angels' message? Because it's pointing us back to the Creator. Right? So the Sabbath points us back to the Creator. The three angels' message points us back to the Creator. It points us back to creation, God being the Creator of all things. Um, okay, um, so the question here, if there was a question, let me see. Sorry, I have to keep going back and forth, like I said, because I don't have the physical lesson in front of me. Um, but it, it basically is asking in the lesson study, um, I apologize. I don't Getting a little confused here on this. Uh, trying to go back to the lesson study. I apologize. Any comments or questions on where we're at so far? No? Okay. So. One, one thing while you're, while you're looking at that is when you think about the seventh day Sabbath, you think about the natural elements that help us to measure time. Um, and then we have the sun. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah, it, it's the only thing that doesn't add up with, you know, everything else, like you said. You know, we know what a day is. We know what a year is according to what the planets do. But there's no explanation for the seven-day week that we have. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing it up. Dr. Herbert, go ahead. Uh, which day lesson would that be? Tuesdays, Wednesday? Thursday, okay.
You said the last sentence. Therefore, all Seventh day Adventist education. Yeah, he, jumping a little bit ahead, it's okay, though, because we are running out of time. But, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, you know, when we think about all these ideas that people have and all of these beliefs, even religious beliefs and non-religious beliefs alike, um, as I said earlier, you know, you can take 20 people off the street and ask them the same questions concerning God or evolution versus creation, and every person will probably have a different answer. Fortunately, we have one thing that we base our faith in our moral code, what this said, uh, which is great because without it, we wouldn't even have a moral code. Which, by the way, did you know that atheism was invented for the sake of being able to not have to account for your sins? So if I don't believe in God, then I don't have to worry about what sin is. What the, and by the way, that's how we know what sin is, because of the commandments of God, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't really know that it was a sin. And so atheists don't have to live up to anything. So I can murder, kill, steal, all of those things. And I don't have to worry about, you know, that I'm going to die because of it or be judged because of it. So, what's that? No yeah, there's no consequence. And you don't even have to have a conscience even, right? So pretty convenient. Um, Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's the, that's the thing, too. Good point. Uh, you know, with, with the differences of, of beliefs, even in the religious world, um, you know, when they try to take certain things out of the Ten Commandments, you know, they always only want to take the fourth one out, of course. But everything's been changed, according to them. And so then all you got to do is ask them, so it's okay to kill, steal, rob, all that stuff? Oh, no, not at all. Those laws apply. <laughs> Just not the fourth one. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <clears throat> let me pick up where I left off here. Um, uh, okay, I'm just about to, I apologize once again. I don't know how I lost my spot. But anyway, uh, for Seventh-day Adventists, the Bible remains a founda foundational text of our faith. It teaches the worldview, the filter by which we are to see and understand the world which can be very daunting and complicated place. Scripture creates the template to help us better understand the reality we find ourselves in, which we are a part of and often confused and befuddled by. So it's true. When you think about it, there's so many questions that people want to know answers to. You know, what's the meaning of life? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And the list goes on and on and on. Um, the beautiful thing is, the Bible can answer just about any question you have concerning life and where we're going to go. It, it really does. And it has good answers and good moral answers. So I think that people that are outside of Christianity really are confused, you know. Uh, well, think of Babylon, right? And Babylon is even in the church. So imagine how much more confused people are outside of the church. And they are. I question people all the time about things, Christians and non-Christians alike, and you'll ask them things, um, well, I think, you know, but when we study the Word of God and we understand it, we can have definite answers to truth. And the way we know that it's truth is just by observing and digging deep, because sometimes you have to dig real deep to get those answers. Okay, um, so yeah, we aren't confused as much as the world is. Fortunately, as Seventh-day Adventists, we must fir firmly adhere to the teachings of the Bible, for this is God's revealed truth to humans, explaining for us many things about the world that we would otherwise not know or understand. Hence, all Christian education must be rooted and grounded in the Word of God, and any teaching contrary to it must be rejected. Uh, somebody once asked me, you don't believe, or they, were, they weren't asking, they were just saying, you don't really believe everything in the Bible, do you? And I said, yes, everything. 
Of course, he called me a fool after that, but <laughs> you know, I'm not going to change my stance. I do believe the Bible to be 100% true. Do I believe that it's not flawed? That's a different question. Um, I've seen the truth, actually, that there are minor little things, and that's only through, through um, in, uh, different interpretations of the Bible, and that's where we've got to be really careful. Even from the Hebrew to the uh, English version is really difficult to translate, so they did have a few problems there with the wording. So we've got to be careful. That's why I understand that a lot of people will only stick to the King James Version. I, I understand that more better now that I've seen other versions that will take one word and change it, but that change could totally lead you into not truth anymore. But that's where we have to dig deep. That's why we've got to be very careful when we study also. But yes, I do believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God, and I do believe it to be 100% truth. Uh, is there anybody that would disagree with that? No? Okay. <laughs> and if you do, it's okay. Um, okay. Any comments? Okay, let's go to Wednesday's lesson. Worship the Redeemer. Um, so as crucial as the doctrine of creation is to our faith, the doctrine does not appear alone, especially in the New Testament. It often comes coupled with even inextricably tied to the doctrine of redemption. And that's because, frankly, in the fallen world of sin and death, creation alone isn't enough. We live, we struggle, we suffer, and then what? This was really interesting, the way it was worded. We die ultimately, winding up no different from animal carcasses left on the side of the road. Um, sad but true. Uh, this world is not all peaches and cream. There is struggles and challenges that we all face, every one of us. Um, fortunately, that we're not left alone. But what the lesson is telling us here, that, uh, that uh, there's, there's two things that we have here. You know, we have creation, but without redemption, Creation isn't of much use to us, is it? If you think about it, I mean, if we just had the Old Testament talking about creation and God without the redemption part, so they, they have to go together, right? Okay. Um, how great is that, it says? Well, that's great because it's great news to know that despite all that we go through, that we have an opportunity for a better life and a, and a better world. Um, hence, we have a crucial, or excuse me, hence we have as crucial to our worldview the doctrine of redemption as well, and that means we have Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected at the center of all that we believe. Yes, that should be the focal point and center of everything, as Paul said. He said, I preach Christ and Christ crucified, right? Because it's ever so important that we have that and understand that to know that there's meaning to this life and that we have an opportunity for something better. Um, we don't have time to read all of John 1 through 14, but if you want to just go there and look at some of the things, because I'm just going to ask the question that it's asking. Um, uh, what are these texts telling us about who Jesus was and what he has done for us. Number one, what does it tell us who Jesus is? John 14, verse 1. The Word, but what is the Word? What is the Word? Well, it says that the Word was made flesh in 14, verse 14, right? So it's saying Jesus is the Word, but more importantly than that, it's telling us that Jesus is God, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? In the beginning. So it's taking us back to the creation once again, isn't it? In the beginning. What happened in the beginning? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So Jesus was there in the beginning of creation, right? Okay, so first angel's message, we already went over that just a little bit. Um, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment 
has come and worship him made heaven and earth to see in the springs of water. Um, the lesson tells us that uh, notice the everlasting gospel is linked directly to creation. Right? The angel's message is linked directly to creation. Right? Um, so it's linking us to creation and God is the creator. And when we realize that God who created us is the same God who in human flesh bore the punishment for our sins upon himself, it's no wonder we are called to worship him. The Bible says greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay his life down for a friend. Greater love. So it's telling us there's no greater love than that. And who wouldn't? Think about somebody whose life has been saved, you know, from whatever they were saved from. You know, maybe they, it was a burning car accident that somebody was in and they were rescued. How indebted would, would, do you think you would feel to somebody who had just saved your life? Right? So it's telling us, God saves our lives. Shouldn't he be worshipped? Besides that, even greater than that, he created everything. He created us. Doesn't that deserve worship? I don't think there's anything else that would deserve worship other than the fact that he created us and he redeems us. Right? Okay. Um, that, that he actually came. That's what, ama that's what always amazes me and breaks my heart about the gospel is that here is God himself and he comes down in human form to rescue us. God himself lowering himself to the lowest standard just about to become one of us to save us. Okay. Um, what other response should there be from us when we realize what our God is really like? For this reason, Christ and him crucified must remain front and center to all we teach. Amen? A teaching that, in fact, must include the second coming as well because Christ's first coming doesn't really do a whole lot of good apart from the second. One could argue from the scripture that Christ's first and second coming are two parts of one event, the plan of salvation. I like the way they put that together. Um, first coming, second coming both reveal the plan of salvation. Um, is there any other comments before we close? I wish we had more time as usual. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I think that yeah, you mean like here in church, watch it? I think that's a really good idea is that one day maybe we should have like after church or sometime plan a day or something. Um, if you don't have the DVD and you wanted to come and watch it here, yeah, that would be, that'd be a great thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, it'll bring a, so much understanding, more understanding of what we already have into the bigger picture. Uh, let me just give a word of prayer in closing here for us. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful for the uh, idea of the worldview that you give us, Father, according to the biblical worldview that we have as Christian believers. Father, I pray today that uh, we would dive more into this study of the understanding of Christ being the center and focal point of all that we studied today um, as God being our creator and our redeemer. Uh, we're so grateful for that, Lord, and we thank you, Father. Uh, we just pray today also that uh, whatever we've talked about and learned today uh, would resonate in our minds and stick with us, Father, uh, as we leave here today. Father, I pray uh, also today for our leaders today and our pastor and our, the rest of our services as we go out into the rest of our church services today. Father, I pray for blessings for each and every one of us today, Father, that these uh, words spoken, your, your, your scriptures today have not fallen on deaf ears, Father. But above all, as James says, that uh, we would be doers of thy word and not just hearers only, Father. Thank you, Father, for the time spent with you today, Father. May we all be blessed today by this Sabbath day and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, thanks for joining us today, class.